Chapter 21. Things you'll miss. Apologies if that title has made this chapter sound a bit doom and gloom and like some sort of pregnancy self-help book, because it's not. It's really not. Thank God for that. It's more of a guide to what you'll miss rather than how to prepare yourself. Although, I suppose I could quickly go over a few things here. First of all, children are genuinely wonderful. They have this magical ability to make you forget your problems and they possess this incredible skill of bringing a grin to your face no matter how sad you feel. I'm talking more about your own children here. Other people's children are usually very annoying. Like, you love them and you enjoy the company, but truth be told, they're not officially yours and you can see straight through the bullshit. Luckily, they're not your responsibility. You've got enough of that as it is. Yeah, other people's kids can fuck off. There really is no other feeling like having a baby. The love you feel for them is incredible. Little do you know that when this baby arrives that your world will never, literally, never be the same again. Here's a question we receive from a naive couple about to have a baby. I say naive not in a condescending way, rather in an understanding way, as if you're a parent and you've been there. We're all guilty of being slightly naive before our baby comes along. Hi, Rosie and Chris. My wife is pregnant with our first baby, which is due in May. I was wondering, what things do you miss slash are unable to do anymore after becoming parents that you didn't realise you would? So, things that aren't immediately obvious. For example, sleep. I would love some advance warning. Thanks, much appreciated. Reese. OK, so I could jump straight into the deep end here and reply... Everything. But I feel that would be a tad cruel. So, instead, Chris and I have devised a little bullet point list with some definite things you will have to wave goodbye to. Strap in, Reese. Dear listener, before you listen to this, please remember that babies are fantastic, lush and lovely. I personally wouldn't give mine up for the world, but the flipping hard work in your life will never be the same again. I'd like to add, I wouldn't give up our son either, but would also still like to invite cash offers. Point one, sleep. Sleep is absolutely top of the shop. Not just the amount of sleep, but also the ability to sleep when you want. Being able to stay up and watch telly as late as you would like is also out of the window. If you still want to carry out your daily duties as a functioning human being, then no more late nights, I'm afraid. More about this later. Point two, being able to eat a full meal without having to give any of it away. Our little boy, Robin, could have exactly the same meal as me on his plate, yet he will still try to steal most of mine. I once did this back to him, and he had a monumental breakdown. We now share everything, begrudgingly, as it's just too emotionally draining. I can't remember the last time I got to finish a bag of crisps. And pizza. He eats his, then starts on mine. I'm going to have to resort to eating exclusively Vindaloo's when he's about, but I know he developed a taste for it. Oh, then he's far to be unbearable. Point three. Eating a treat in front of your child or drinking a cup of juice in front of them. Forget about it. They will want it, they will steal it. If they can see it, it's no longer yours. Forever. I eat most of me biscuits inside the kitchen cupboard. It's nowhere near as enjoyable as it used to be, but needs most. I have been known to eat a cream egg in the toilet and once ate a Victoria sponge in the shower. The shower wasn't on. I just stood in the cubicle and closed the door, fully clothed, and ate the slice of cake with me hands like a winner. Is that a true story? Yeah. Wow. Point four. Pissing or shitting alone. I've tried numerous diversion tactics over the years, but to absolutely no avail. It would appear that as soon as your arse hits the seat, it is in their mind the perfect moment to tell you something. It's always pointless information and it usually ends up with me having to do something, thus cutting my precious toilet alone time short. Yep, he came in and showed me some Lego we'd built while I was sitting on the toilet just yesterday. Point five. Bathing alone. Same as pissing and shitting alone, really, but they usually hop in with all their toys. And inevitably, you'll miss bathing in water that doesn't have toddler piss in it. Sometimes me and Robin will be in the bath together and he can tell when he's having a sneaky wee in it. He'll stop talking and kind of look off into the distance for a second. And I'll say, are you having a wee? He used to deny it. Then he started denying it and then laughing. Then he started admitting it and laughing. Then he started shouting, I'm having a wee, while doing it. 
It continued escalating until it got to the stage where he would actually choose not to have a wee in the toilet before his bath so he could wee in the bath with me in it. It's now reached an unprecedented level where he literally stands up in the bath we are sharing and pisses back into the water in front of me. Absolutely feral. Point six. Basically doing anything alone ever again. You have to literally steal yourself away like a spy if you want to watch a video on your phone that has swearing in it. Sometimes, if Robin and Rosie are doing something that takes just the two of them, videoing each other or dancing or painting or something that basically doesn't need me, I'll just go off and sit in another room in silence for a bit, just for a bit of quiet time. Sometimes I don't even take my phone. I'm considering inventing jobs that need to be done in the loft and just going and sitting up there on a dusty floor for a bit of space. Point seven. Swearing or talking about anything adult-themed in your own home. Gone are the days of airing your feelings. You have to learn to speak in code. Don't slag off your parents in front of your children either, as they'll most likely tell them, and that just opens up a full can of worms that you don't need. To be fair, the amount of things that we have to spell out in conversation now has really improved my overall literacy. You want to quickly know how to spell a swear word? I'm your man. It's actually helped with this book, to be honest. The most frustrating thing is when you're spelling something out or talking in code and your partner doesn't understand what you're getting at. Or, even worse, and this is the most common one, you start using code and your partner talks normally and fucks the whole thing up. This usually happens when she's on her phone and only half listening. Rosie, when he goes to bed, shall we O-R-D-E-R-C-U-R-R-Y? Oh, yes, I'd love a curry. Oh, shit, man, Rosie. So then Robin's running around going, Curry, I want some poppadoms. Shit, man. Point eight. Having a tidy slash clean house. Well, I can't comment on this because I gave up that when I married Rosie. Point nine. Watching what you want on the TV. I've became obsessed with interior decorating and cookery shows lately as they're the only things I can watch during the day without any swears. Again, gave this up when I married Rosie. Point ten. Listening to music you want to listen to. Again, starting to see a pattern here, Rosie. I have lost track of how many times I'll be out in the car listening to my Spotify account and the music will quickly change to the PJ Masks theme, CBeebies or Bette Midler because you and Robin are using a smart speaker at home, which is linked to it. And I will say this again, my Spotify account. I almost crashed the car attempting to change it back a thousand times when I get an angry phone call telling us to listen to the radio. Point 11. Popping anyway. Being unable to go anywhere quickly without a screaming match becomes the new norm. Bribery will become your new best friend. You'll come out of all of this like some sort of politician, striking up deals on a daily basis. Unfortunately, in our house, this has recently backfired a little, as the other day Robin was actually bribing me, and I fell for it, hook, line and singer. I told him it was time to brush his teeth, and he said, if you let me watch one more Mr. Men, I'll be a good boy while you brush me teeth. Little shit is catching on. Damn it. You basically have to factor some hostage negotiation time into every trip. And on the subject of bribing, Rosie seems to have a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do policy. She can literally offer Robin chocolate, toys and a controlling stake in a Fortune 500 company to get in the car, but if I dare to give him a single piece of Lego to stop him kicking off, I'm spoiling him. Point 12. A clean car. Again, gave this up a while ago. The sheer amount of shit that Rosie deposited in the door compartment of my old car was staggering. Murray mint wrappers, some of them with half-sucked mints in them, chewed up straws, apple cores, crisp packets, crisp packets with apple cores in them, bottles, car park tickets, car park tickets with chewing gum in them. You name it, it was there. I genuinely went to pick up a new car from the dealership and the salesman said these words. Only problem is, it doesn't have compartments in the doors. I nearly kissed him. And her face, when she got in and realised it didn't have door compartments, it was like telling someone that the hotel room didn't have a toilet. She never drives my car now, claiming it's because she's worried she'll damage it, but I know it's really because there's no way for her to deposit her waste as she drives along sucking sweet after sweet like an old nana at the bingo. Ha ha, no, no, you're wrong. I just hate your car. And mine is absolutely nowhere near as bad as you're describing it here, like. Point 13. Your body. This is more so for the ladies. Say hello to your new little shelf lasses. Obviously, it goes without saying the human body is wonderful and I'm so grateful and amazed at the fact that my own body was able to grow and birth my beautiful baby boy. 
But for God's sake, could you not have allowed us to keep any parts of my pre-baby body? I think the only thing that didn't change was me nose. Don't even get us started on bloody bladder weakness. What a lovely little surprise that was. I can't really comment on this apart from to say that it's not a great idea while your wife or partner is pregnant or still carrying baby weight to loudly and proudly exclaim, I've lost half a stone even though I'm eating loads of takeaways. It tends to cause a bit of friction. Point 14. Relaxing. It's hard to switch off when you've got kids. You're now constantly on call, even when you're asleep, even when you're at work, probably even when you're dead. And the moment they disappear into another room and start playing quietly is the moment you have to be most alert because the little shits are up to something. They've found something or gained access to something that they shouldn't have. You now have two choices. A. Enjoy the peace and silence for as long as it lasts and clean up the possible disaster area at a later point. Or B. Stand up now, go through and stop the disaster in its tracks, but knowing full well that you have also stopped any peace and quiet that you were about to enjoy in its tracks. Choose wisely. Point 15. Clean windows. Once your little one is walking by themselves, you'll never look out of a window in your house without a manky, smarmy, titanic sex scene-esque hand mark on it. Well, I'm never going to be able to look at those marks the same way again. Thanks for that. Point 16. Having a sit-down three-course meal. Eating slowly and enjoying yourself in a restaurant are both a thing of the past. Even when you are without your child, as you'll inevitably have to get back home for the babysitter, or you'll get too excited like we do and have too much to drink before your meal and get tired and want an early night with a lie in the next day. You are now a Dine and Dash family. Onlookers might be forgiven for thinking that you're running away without paying the bill because you are in and out of there at such speed. And you now have to profusely apologise to the waiters for the absolute state of the floor under your table and your kid's chair. Or do what we do and tidy it up yourself, like you work there. Point 17. Being able to glance at your phone without it being taken off you. Robin loves playing on my phone. Although you can get around this by never putting games on your phone, but then I end up having to quickly download them as we enter a restaurant just so we can eat in peace. I deliberately have no games on my phone at all. I've told him, games don't work on Daddy's phone. He actually thinks my phone is worse than Rosie's, even though it's the same model. And you can still get YouTube kids on it. Sucker. Point 18. Not feeling constantly guilty. I feel guilt every day. In fact, I can quite confidently say that there's not a day gone by since our little boy's birth that I've not experienced some sort of guilt. I remember it started the day we brought him home from the hospital when I asked Chris, Do you think he's happy? Do you think he likes the house? As if I asked that. He is the luckiest little kid in the world. He's already better off than I ever was being born into his own room. Must be nice, eh? You feel like you need some time away from the kid, you feel guilty. You have that time away, you miss them, you feel guilty. You're with them and not playing with them enough, you feel guilty. You let them watch TV, you feel guilty. The list goes on and on. Point 19. Sticking to plans. It's just so difficult getting out the house. You don't have the energy. Never before has lying on the sofa at the end of the day been so bloody inviting. You'll find that you're rarely on time for anything once you have a child. I used to always pride myself on being quite a punctual person until I had Robin. Now I'm either extremely late or extremely early and there's no in between. I tried not to be late so I started to get ready ridiculously early and make sure I'd leave the house at least an hour early. And I'd arrive places too soon, which is never a good idea because kids don't like to be in the same place for longer than an hour. So you've already shot yourself in the foot. It's a logistical nightmare. Constantly. To be fair, I've always loved cancelling plans. If I can get out of a night out and stay in, I am buzzing. I can safely say that in my life I've cancelled more nights out than I've actually gone on. Point 20. A leisurely stroll around the supermarket. Those days are gone. If they aren't crying, they're asking for everything in sight. We usually open stuff and let Robin eat it on the way around, then scan the empty packets at the end like the shameful nearly thieves we are. You can't go wrong with a fresh white baguette and a punnet of grapes. Hashtag Dine and Dash, a.k.a. Supermarket Lunch. Point 21. Hangover slash sick days on the settee. 
This point right here is something I never fully took into consideration before having a child. I actually feel this may need its own little subchapter in the book. What do you reckon, Chris? Oh, yeah, definitely. 